with John Brocker, and here we are with the uh, Unity of Springfield Adult Education um, World Religions class, and today we're going to be talking about uh, Green Throw, which is just a little book um, that has little excerpts of different things that Thoreau wrote, uh, including uh, Walden, but and, and also his book on, uh, on slavery, as well as just other essays. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about Henry David here in a few moments. Um, welcome to you, the folks who are online. Glad to know that there's some folks that are watching this morning and we're going to start with um, a reading so let's get comfortable take some breaths as you prefer to get in that kind of calm spot Above all, we cannot afford not to live in the present. He is blessed over all mortals who loses no moment of the passing life in remembering the past. Unless our philosophy bears, hears the cock crow in every barnyard within our horizon, it is belated. That sound commonly reminds us that we are growing rusty and antique in our employments and habits of thought. His philosophy comes down to a more recent time than ours. There is something suggested by it that is a newer testament, the gospel according to this moment. He has not fallen astern. He has gotten up early and kept up early to be where he is to be in season in the foremost rank of time. It is an expression of health and soundness of nature, a brag for all the world, healthiness as of a spring burst forth, a new fountain of the muses to celebrate this last instant of time. So this morning, in, in this last several weeks, when I've been reading this book, and I got a little more curious. I had read Walden, I don't know, when I was in college or years ago, and I hadn't really spent much time um, with him previously, although I, I always hear about him here and there. And uh, I was up at Unity Village, and they were having a sale of books for like two bucks a piece <laughs> and I came upon I went through I went through all their books on their on their table and one of them that I found was this green throw and its subtitle is America's first environmentalist on technology possessions livelihood and more and just as a, an editor just took excerpts out of uh, some of those stories and that's kind of what I have on the handouts that are just some little sayings that he's uh, that he's written. So I got a little bit curious about Thoreau, and I, I looked up on online, and I found uh, an article from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy about Henry David Thoreau, and it was I learned some things that I hadn't known. So what what have you all? What do you all know about Thoreau? Come on, Paul. Well, he was a close friend of uh, ah, Emerson. Emerson, yes. In fact, I think he, I think, I believe Emerson owned the land that he lived on, if I'm not mistaken. 
at Walden Pond. At Walden Pond, that's right, yeah. And, uh, you know, I read parts of Walden Pond, but I, you know, Walden, but I didn't read the whole thing. <laughs> so, yeah. To me, uh, the, the word simplicity comes first. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's one thing he is known for, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Jackson was a Unitarian Universalist. Well, at, at the time, uh, they were he was part of the trans, known as a transcendentalist, right. which is what Emerson right. is. Um, however, he, he broke with Emerson on on a couple of uh, areas, and they were good friends, but they were always fighting. <laughs> because they didn't really see eye to eye on a number of, of, of issues. Um, and some of it maybe was the simplicity too, that mm -hmm. was a, a part of that. And also his, he was more into nature mm -hmm. than, than was uh, Emerson. Uh, and plus they had personal issues. So he graduated from Harvard, um, and he worked um, in the family pencil business. His, his, I guess his dad had, had a pencil factory or pencil making business. Uh, he also did lecturing and some writing, uh, and but probably the most work that he did was as a surveyor. And he liked to walk about and do things and, and uh, I, that was kind of the location that was that he did the most of anything though um, he was I think one of the personal issues between he and Emerson was I think Emerson kind of thought he was lazy uh, because he preferred to spend his mornings in meditation live a simple life as a way of not having to work harder so that he could could spend that time in, in the silence. Um, he also uh, was did not agree with Emerson's idea that that nature was more symbolic. He really believed that, uh, yeah. that, that the nature was more spiritual and on par and connected with the physical. So that, and, and also seeing humans as uh, nature. There's some handouts, if not on the table, there's some here on this front table. Or oh, there are some on your table. Uh, and in fact, Thoreau coined a term wildness that, uh, which he saw as kind of this, the spirit of nature and the spirit of, the, of that also that that is also a spirit within man. That there's, that maybe we lose after we're not a little kid anymore. We lose this wildness. And he was always trying to get back to that, get that back in touch with that part of himself. Um, and that the wildness is not only for the non-human world, but, but as a part of human nature and a conduit to both genius and spirituality. Um, he was also a student of Eastern philosophy. And so that sometimes comes, I think, through a lot of the current moment kinds of um, and, and meditation practices that he took part in. Um, and he also left behind unpub unpublished manuscripts um, of studies of Native American history and culture, uh, which I think maybe have been um, published since then, but not during his lifetime. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, 
real quick since you brought that up about you know the Eastern religion. Do you know if Thoreau was influenced by Emerson or was Emerson influenced by uh, Thoreau on Eastern religion, or did they just come about it on their own and um, well, they each other? Okay, so they were part of this kind of transcendental movement, and they both uh, lived um, in Concord. They were both locals uh, of the same town uh, or city. So they, I think they was mutual, but I, I don't know originally. I mean, you know, obviously Emerson was more famous and uh, wealthier than Thoreau. Um, and, and, they, and all I was able to glean out of it was that they were inter interacted, but didn't always see eye to eye. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I know that, that Emerson also was very much influenced by Eastern's thought. So, yeah. so probably they they were reading a lot of the same things together as contemporaries. I think there was also a, gosh, uh, the woman who, uh, Louisa May Alcott, I believe, was Emerson's neighbor, if I'm not mistaken. I'm wondering if there were other famous people in Concord too. I'm, I'm sure there were. They met at societies and stuff and, and mm -hmm. had things together. I, I think I've read that, that they were, they had the society thing going on. And Correct. They would have meetings and they, yeah. where they would argue out their differences and as well as the things discuss, that they agreed on. Discuss. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you got to cuss and discuss something. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so he was a relatively, uh, uh, he, he only wrote two books. Uh, he wrote Walden in 1854, and he wrote Slavery in Massachusetts, uh, also in 1854. They were both published the same year. Um, and then he wrote um, quite a few essays and articles that were published including uh, in 1849, he uh, wrote Civil Disobedience, which uh, impacted both Gandhi and Martin Luther King. It was very much a, a part of uh, how they came upon their own versions of utilizing civil disobedience. But he was, he was well known as kind of the first one who got out there and coined that term was useful in that way. He participated and supported the Underground Railroad uh, and also fought in, in Massachusetts, the slavery in Massachusetts. The gist of that was that he was, even though slavery was not legal in Massachusetts, they still upheld uh, runaway slave laws and would arrest a runaway slave was not safe in the north necessarily anywhere in the north mm -hmm. until the proclamation in 1863. That's why we went to Canada. Mm -hmm. Why many of them did go to Canada. And so he, that was one of the things that he was always pushing for was for laws, both state and local laws, would, would pass laws to uh, refute. And there were a few states that did that before the proclamation, but it wasn't across the board safe to be in the north uh, if you were in a state of a slave. And that was something that he uh, spoke about. And, and, uh, and, and I think that's maybe another thing, but the difference between Thoreau and, and Emerson was he was a lot more likely to get political on divisive issues that could create some conflict and in fact he even yes isn't it wouldn't it be surprising if they agreed on everything oh my gosh yes <laughs> it would be it would be shocking for anybody oh yes yes <laughs> uh, and 
So anyways, that, that, those were just some of the uh, things that, that, that he was involved in and, and wrote. Some of the quotes that I thought were that were short enough that I could type out, and there's a few more, and I'll refer to that in the book. But I didn't want to take kill too many trees to, to type them out. But uh, he he starts off, um, or the, this gal who put this together. Uh, which was uh, Carol Spinard LaRusso, who was uh, put together this book, and was the editor of this. And it, it starts off with his ideas about nature. And that's where the, the first one that's on here is, I wish to speak a word for nature, for absolute freedom and wildness, as contrasted with a freedom and culturally culture merely civil to regard man as an inhabitant or a part and parcel of nature rather than a member of society. And that was from his essay on walking. So when I also read that, you know, oh, one of his big essays, one of the things that, he, that he, she pulls from in this is an essay on walking. So he was doing walking meditation, you know, before that was something that we had heard about. Eastern Buddhists. Um, he says, he who cuts down the woods beyond a certain limit exterminates birds. And he wrote that in 1853. And nobody's listening. Hmm? I said, and nobody's listening. No, not, not many people were, were too excited about that, but I'm sure there was a, a group. I mean, it would have been cool to have been to have been back in 1853 and listened to, you know, gone to one of these or have a recording of one of these meetings that they had when they were have these discussions and, and such. It, uh, it might have surprised us with how forward thinking some some of these folks. That would have been uh, almost 170 years ago. Yeah. I just think it's kind of interesting when you're talking about he is so for going back to total wild nature. Total wild nature is the strong win, the weak die. Mm -hmm. And slavery is a, an example of the strong overpowering the weak. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting uh, conundrum there in those two philosophies. And he, he does that um, and he's not a dualist. That was that's you know that was another break with, with him and, and, and Emerson was that is he did not really he was bought into the non duality of, of the Eastern way of looking at things. Um, but he flirts a lot with issues um, for instance, he, he uh, focuses some on, you know, that you don't want to waste time. Um, and where, where is he said? He says, uh, as if you could kill time without injuring eternity. So kind of inferring that, you know, if you're, if you're just wasting time, you know, you're missing out on what is. But I think that was a different concept of time. Right. If the, of how, how to use time because I read ahead and it says Right, so then the I next one. I'm working about six weeks a year. I could, I could take and meet all my expenses. But, and, but his use of time was to appreciate nature. Correct. And we would sometimes call that killing time, yes. you know, going yeah. out and fishing or whatever. Yes. And but to him that was absorbing and and bringing that into himself. 
So he didn't consider that to be wasting. Uh, what is wasting? Yeah. yeah. Right. So yeah. So there's ne the next quote I have after that one was, "Many a forenoon have I stolen away, preferring to spend the most valued part of the day, for I was rich, if not in money, in sunny hours and summer days, and spent them lavishly." Oh, I love that so much. <laughs> and, and so he, you know, on one hand, he's, you know, and, and, and on the other hand, he's also saying, you know, and when he was on Walden, living in Walden for those couple of years, he realized that he didn't need so much. So he could get by with just working these six weeks a year, and that was... That's all he found that you know he you know he could you pretty know. much a minimalist. Yeah, basically. Yeah, um, yeah, an early minimalist. <laughs> and and I think it's because he valued. He called mornings forenoons. He called mornings what? Forenoon. Okay. okay. And so he. He valued the forenoon, the morning, the, the, a, to be a time of silence and quietness and just be in nature and either go walking or just sitting by the pond. And, and um, it, it, for him, that was and just, you know, he talked about being, you know, a, a, on one of his quotes that I didn't put on here, it is talking about a thunderstorm and it raining and, uh, you know, and should you go for shelter, this or that? He says, I just go under a tree and he'd be examining the bark and the, just the, the little things and the little insects that were in on the tree and, and that, that was for him that he was, his day was totally full and the rain really had nothing to do with it at all. It maybe kind of led him to be in by the tree, but then after that it was like, What's interesting here? Got, yeah, he just got immersed into it, and, 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 and that was that was um, what he got into. Uh, and another way that he looks at wildness as being uh, well, okay. So that also he talks about kind of conservation. Each town should have a park, or rather a primitive forest of five hundred or a thousand acres where a stick should never be cut for fuel, a common possession forever for instruction and recreation. He wrote that in 1859. So I imagine Teddy Roosevelt must have stumbled upon Thoreau at some, some part of his education, uh, thankfully. And then this, the concept of wildness, he said, wildness is the preservation of the world. Life consists of wildness. The most alive is the wildest. So it, there he's really speaking to some spiritual sense of what, what this wildness concept is in that connection. Which I understood what he meant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sometimes his, his poetic uh, prose Kind of like looking at a picture of art, so it's really yours to interpret. You see what's just yeah. yeah. You know, I just wanted to comment about the wildness that you're talking about. Um, I think there's kind of a, almost a romance or a romantic feeling that goes along with that. You know, when you have that feeling of wildness and that you're part of that nature, and um, you know, it makes me think of at least a certain segment of our shelterless population that I would say probably the vast majority of those are just who lack funds, you know, some mental issues, emotional issues. But I think there's also a certain segment that would choose that regardless. <laughs> And yeah. there is a certain element of um, Intrigue, I think, that goes along with that feeling of freedom, that feeling of, you know, I'm my own you know, initiator of life. You know? mm -hmm. 
and uh, just exploring um, that that wildness, I think. And so, um, I know I, I I guess the closest I could touch upon that is, um, you know, when I, you know, possibly went on my six week bike journey and saw, you know, just felt like, hey, I can stay in the woods here if I want. Right. And, you know, I can speak with who I want and not speak with who I want. I can, you know, take care of myself on my own without anybody knowing anything about who I am or, or express myself, you know, in a creative way. <laughs> Absolutely. 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 That, yes. Well, with, uh, Paul talking about people with mental illness, but I, I'm a member of NAMI, and there is a certain diagnosis of people with certain mental illnesses that just feel like if they was to live in a in a house or a building, they feel like they're in a in a prison. Mm -hmm. And they choose to live in the home, homeless type setting so that they can feel not, feel that they're not in a prison. Mm -hmm. Brenda, can you? You know, when we use the term wildness, it kind of brings to mind an idea of being totally out of control. But um, as I've studied deeper into metaphysics, and, and, and so kind of where I've been at now, I've gone for several months of just going, looking at what's happening and going, well, wait a minute. If everything that's true of God is true of that person or true of me in this moment, uh, is it true? Could this possibly be true? And so I've just kept going to that place. Well, the next step that has come for me is the step of sitting here and going, in this moment, what do I want? What do I want to create? Of course, I believe that we are the creators of our experience. So I sit here and I go, let's see, do I want this or not? Oh, yes, okay, yes. Do I want this or not? Oh, no, so not it. But the thing about it is, is rather than it being, that to me is a form of going back to the wildness within it, to be able to listen to our own voice, to listen to our connection to source, rather than it be filtered through the world and filtered through other opinions and filtered through expectations and the past. That to me is a more better definition of the wildness within us, rather than saying the wildness within us, the connectedness within us, the, the God source within us. Thank you. So this is uh, a little excerpt that was too long for me to put on the handout. It says, I have met with but one or two persons in the course of my life who understand the art of walking, that is, of taking walks, who had a genius, so to speak, for sauntering, which word is beautifully derived from the idle people who roved about the country in the Middle Ages and asked charity under pretense of going a la Saint Terre to the Holy Land, till the children exclaimed, there goes a Saint Terror, a saunter, a Holy Lander. They who never go to the Holy Land in their walks, as they pretend, are indeed mere idlers and vagabonds, but they who do go there are saunterers in the good sense, such as I mean. Some, however, would derive the word from sans terre without land or a home, which therefore in the good sense will mean having no particular home, but equally at home everywhere. For this is the secret of successful sauntering. He who sits in a house all the time may be the greatest vagrant of all, but the saunterer, in the good sense, is no more vagrant than the meandering river, which is all the while seduciously seeking the shortest course to the sea. I'm like gone. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Yeah. So it kind he kind of was speaking to some of the same things that, that you all have. On. Um, he says, if you have built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. That is where they should be. Now put the foundations under them. And this I do have on there. I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability of man to elevate his life by a conscious endeavor. Another one I didn't put on the handout, which gets at, I think of some of the social media, uh, but for him it had to do with, the closest thing to social media was the mail at the time. So he said, in proportion as our inward life fails, we go more constantly and desperately to the post office. You many depend on it that the poor fellow who walks away with the greatest number of letters, proud of his extensive correspondence, has not heard from himself this long while. But he's got a little bit of sense of humor too. I did write this one in that I also thought was one of the better ones. The universe is wider than our view of it. Be a Columbus to whole new continents and worlds within you, opening new channels, not of trade, but of thought. So, uh, you know, the, the whole idea that when we're not doing, when we're being, there is some work. That you are interested. Yeah. I mean, and it takes work to be present, to, to focus, to be aware. Mm -hmm. and, and I think awareness is, is something. Yeah. Is it work or lack of work? Both. I mean, it's, it's, it's that conundrum that you run into. On, on one hand, um, you know, the gently bringing yourself back to the current moment takes some effort. It, does, it doesn't have to be, it's not like a heavy burden, but it, yeah. but it is intentional. Yeah, we have to have, we were just studying about that yesterday in, in uh, Abraham, that it, it all, about, it all uh, sort of boiled down to the fact that attention uh, controls our focus and the focus controls the output. Uh, controls what actually happens, mm -hmm. and and I think that's essentially what he's saying here. That uh, if you're going to be in the present, it's your, your attention has to be there. Correct. And if it's if it's there in the in in the in the present, what you focus on is critical, and that. That focus depends on what you do, what what you produce, what you manifest. What you manifest, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Do you want the, the mic? Yeah, yeah. Let's go ahead. Try and keep that going. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, this one verse is like get me. In any weather, at any hour, day or time, day or night. I have been anxious to improve the nick of time and notch it on my stick too. For stand in the meeting of two eternities, the past, the future, which is precisely the present moment. I, so many things have happened in my life in the nick of time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 60 degrees in the morning and it goes to 17 that night and that's the day that I get my water buried so that it doesn't freeze. And just recently, I transferred a house in Tulsa that was going to a demolition hearing 
21 hours before the hearing, so they canceled it. And it's like, yeah, I would not, there are, I have been anxious to improve the nick of time sometimes, but it's like, you just have to, I just had to keep holding fast. You know, God has my back, God has my back, God has my back, this is gonna happen. And it, you know, it came in 21 hours. And it's like, it, it is, it is a thing that you have to just, you get anxious, but then you have to go back to holding that space that it's going to happen. But I've had so many things at the nick of time that that first is, and I'm like, Nick is my friend. <laughs> so Don said the word trust. Yeah. What's that? You used to just said the word trust when she was speaking about... Yeah, about you, you just have to go back. You know, every time that you get anxious, you just have to go, I trust, you know, and it is. God has my back, has trust inferred in it. Correct. You know, and I just had to keep holding that. And sometimes it was a little challenging. But, you know, it came together. One of my favorite one was, uh, none can be more useful to a man or woman. Uh, I added the gender because he always just said man. Uh, then a determination not to be heard. Say it again. Nothing can be more useful to a man or woman than a determination not to be heard. So what is being heard? Being taught by a leader to a mouse. <laughs> or being heard in what society like wants and expects us to do. Well, it's future focused to be heard. Hmm. You're not being you're not in the present moment if you're heard. Oh, I've got to get this done quickly. I've got to get it done before. What if? It's not done at some future time. It's future focused. So if you're hurried, you're not really fully present. And then we miss out on what is, right? So when at the beginning of Walden, oh, go ahead. Again, I have no idea for for Walden uh, what he believed spiritually and stuff, but I can only take it into the arena that I'm in. And what I know is that uh, the metaphysical beliefs that we are creators creating our life through our focus, through the power that we've been given. And the, uh, to practice that in fullness is to be here in this moment, aware of that which you desire, aware of who you really are, aware that all others are the same, and that we can create whatever we want. But any time that I go to a future projection that has not yet happened, and I give that the power to determine what's possible, or I go back to the past of what's been created before and give that the power to determine, I'm always gonna limit myself. And so to stay present in this moment means to stay present to all possibility, anything I desire, and to the joy of creating, rather than the fear of my, what I create might harm me and how do I protect myself. So, uh, to, there's this one quote which talked about some of his motivation to, uh, to go live at Walden's Pond. 
I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discovered that I had not lived. So he must have been feeling some sense of distension in his, in his life before he spent the time on, on Walden Pond, which was in the 1840s, even though it didn't get published till, till later. He uh, spent that two, two years, two months there at Walden's Pond and, uh, with kind of the minimalist, simple lifestyle and, uh, and allowed himself to spend his mornings just in, in meditation. Yeah. Was it that there was this land? I believe it was, yes. We talked about that earlier, in, in, and we do believe that it probably was Emerson's land, although I do not know that for a fact. Oh, I, I had read that, that yeah. he was, that he rented from Emerson. So I'm assuming it's fact. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, I, I guess that's the first time I've ever heard with, it was only two months that he lived on Walden Pond. Two years and two oh, months. two years and two months. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, okay. Anyways, that's those were the those were the. Let's see. I had another one. Uh, okay. In the long run, men hit only what they aim at. Therefore, though they fail immediately, they had better aim at something high. John Farmer sat at his door one September evening after a hard day's work, his mind still running on his labor, more or less. He had not attended to the train of his thoughts long when he heard someone playing a flute, and that sound harmonized with his mood. The notes of the flute came home to his ears out of a different sphere from that he worked in and suggested work for certain faculties which slumbered in him. They gently did away with the street and the village and the state in which he lived. A voice said to him, why do you stay here and live this mean, moily life when a glorious existence is possible for you? The same stars twinkle over the other fields than these. But how to come out of this condition and actually migrate thither? All that he could think of was to practice some new austerity, to let his mind descend into his body and redeem it, and treat himself with ever-increasing respect. <clears throat> that was from Walden in the chapter of Higher Laws. <clears throat> And that's really basically all that I have for this morning. Yes, go ahead. One comment. Uh, Here, you are. Use the mic. Thanks. I'm just coming back from a camping trip, and uh, I haven't. We can't hear it on the internet. Yeah. Oh, it's just hold the mic. Yeah, you have to hold it up to your mouth. Okay, this is too complicated. I can hear it. Just coming back from a camping trip, and uh, I was sitting outside in the morning out in this. I was next to the forest and I'm thinking, I'm having a cup of coffee and the sun is just coming up and I'm thinking the king in his counting house is not as rich as I. That some of the things in the world are open to all of us regardless of wealth or position or anything. So we just have to appreciate them. Absolutely. Thank you. Absolutely. And I think that yeah, Thoreau was right on that the whole idea that we live fully I, I, 
I was going to just say there is. Um, well, I have a I have a house that I built personally um, in the woods near the wild and scenic riverways, about 100 miles from here, uh, east of here, and lived there before I even built the house. I uh, had rented other dwellings there, and, and one of them had no electricity, had no water, no running water, that is. Um, heated with a wood stove, uh, such as yourself, I believe, John, mm -hmm. and um, had thousands of acres which I could easily wander anywhere I wanted to, to, um, and there exists many caves, springs, you know, the wild and scenic riverways, and um, I guess I never felt so rich in my life. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet I still work too, I was a teacher there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I think it's that contrast that we have, you know, where, most people blindly, or at least partially blindly, are chasing after that almighty dollar all the time, you know, as, as the ultimate you know, goal in their lives, you know, to accumulate, to accumulate the toys, to accumulate everything. And to, from what I get from Walden is, you know, just another way of looking at, you know, What's, what is value <laughs> in our lives? And uh, I have to say, even, even having um, gone without, you know, drawing my own water from a well and carrying that water and chopping my own wood and um, reading by kerosene or by candlelight, that was one of the most valuable experiences you know, that I had, and I really did cherish that. Now, would I go back and do that again? No, because I'm married and she wouldn't appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and I raised children, too. I, I raised seven kids all together. And during that time, they did love coming over and participating in that lifestyle. Um, because at that age, the age that they were at at the time, oh my gosh, it was exciting to run down to the river and jump in and swim and climb a tree and go explore a cave called Splunking. And you know, so those things were all exciting at the time. Would they do that now? No. <laughs> you know, I mean, they would some of the things, but you know, they, they've already experienced that and so it would not be the same, I don't think. But I think it's just, it's just a different way of looking that, gosh, wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to always chase money all the time, to chase possessions, um, and to know what it might be like to truly live. You know, if we all had that freedom, what, what would we choose? It occurs to me that it's it's becoming more difficult all the time to seek this simplicity of life because whatever you uh, whatever you think you're you're getting there you you get a text or you get a telephone call or something else uh, intervenes and you have a a constant um, inflow of information or info, inflow of requirements on your life that you uh, don't seem to have any control over with when you carry that phone because you're always in contact with everybody, everybody you know. And it, it's, uh, it's, it becomes a challenge for that reason, or for one of those reasons, we uh, we don't participate in that. Uh, Wendy and I don't participate in that kind of a thing because we do like the simplicity. Uh, nor do we watch news because we don't want to get 
in the in the drama of who did what to whom uh, negatively every time. Mm -hmm. So um, the the challenge for us is to stay focused on inside rather than on the outside. It's uh, it's unfortunate, but that seems to be my only way out. Mm -hmm. To this simplicity. I'll catch it on. I'll come around the other side. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, maybe I missed this because I was late, but, and this question is genuine and kind of for all of you. How can we do it? Like, how? Well, he said he just worked, I guess, six weeks, enough to last him the year. I'm just wondering, like, I would really like to, actually, I kind of already have stepped out, but I feel like I can't say, but I'm having a lot of peace and joy in my life, you know, and just kind of raising my children and, you know, mm -hmm. doing fun things. I'm kind of living the dream, but I can't really keep pulling it off. You know what I mean? I'm gonna have to like, I'm dreading like going back to, you know, society and stuff. I just wonder, there's gotta be a way to at least mostly have the wildness, you know? Mm -hmm. Anyway, I guess that's all I just wanted. I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, I used to work for for uh, my uncle that had a cell barn in Elmira Springs, and I I ground feed for hogs and stuff, and occasionally we would have other work to do, so I would go uh, grind feed and go feed the hogs, and, and they had some wood that needed to be cut for grandpa's something. I would just take a few minutes and wander around in the timber and kind of map out some trees to uh, go cut kind of grandpa's wood, wood with. And one day they, they were saying, what were you doing all that time? I said, well, I, I took a few minutes to just kind of walk out in the timber and map out some wood for to cut grandpa's wood with. And they said, all you was killing two birds with one stone there. <laughs> well, I noticed you said that um, um, Perot did, lived there for two years and two weeks on Walden. But my guess is he probably participated in life a lot like maybe many of the other people did too, you know, afterwards, before. And I, I guess, you know, you're, Monique, you're asking, how do we do that? How do we do it? Every, every choice we have, every moment we have is a choice, right? And, you know, it is a balance, I think, you know, how do we choose, how do we choose to live, you know? <laughs> and and, and it's, it's, it's fun to live very minimalistic. I love that. And, and then it kind of gets old after a while. Too. <laughs> and sometimes, <laughs> you know, you, you can only do that um, when you're making all of your own choices and you're not yeah. in in a relationship where you're, where you know you have to look out for everybody else's needs. And then, you know, like what is, what do you really need? You know, you need not to freeze to death. You need to be able to breathe and you need to be able to have some water and and some sustenance um, that's what we need then past that it's it's really wants and choices and what I you know what I want and what I want to focus on and that's what I want to you know build into it so it's uh, I think part of it was during that time that he was on Walden Pond he didn't have to answer to anybody, uh, 
and other than I guess making the rent check to, to Emerson and uh, and then his food and um, water which was which and, and he, he get hunt and he also had some funny things about like he was vegetarian uh, but but he also talked about you know that he saw a woodchuck and at night one night when he was walking and he thought about just attacking it and eating it raw you know but the wildness came into it he had kind of like a, a, a white fang or a, <laughs> kind of a wild wildness that came upon him uh, but he but and he just didn't eat much and and you know sometimes we we have to make choices like like Paul was saying. Yeah. Well, one of the things I just finished taking the Prosperity Plus class mm -hmm. and Mary Morrissey created her life. She had a mentor that held her to the you know, you don't have to wait ten years to have something happen. And if you can believe it and dream it, you can do it. And within a year, amazing things would happen. And what that class was trying to get you to do was to dream, because when you dream and then you put steps to it, you, you do something every day toward your dream. She's created a life where she does videos and she does workshops and she has fun. All of her kids come in and work with her and she's created the life that she loves. And she is trying to inspire people to look within themselves, find their dream because their dream will support itself. And so that's kind of, it's in you. We can't give you that answer. It's in you, but when you begin to allow yourself to dream and then to take steps toward that dream, then you have that freedom and you don't have to be in the drudgery of, oh, I don't want to go back to a nine to five job. If you go back to a nine to five job,